So let's take a look at it. Two curves indicate these distributions of molecular speeds. Which is which? What do you think? One is SO2. SO2. It's a heavier. Right, so let's first look at what the, yeah, I think you're mostly right. Um, look at what the graph is showing, right? That number one has the distribution of speeds um, in the slower range, so more molecules are moving more slowly. Number two has more molecules moving more quickly. So the larger one, the heavier one, is going to be moving more slowly. The lighter one's going to be more quickly. So one is SO2 and two is CO2 because of that. So uh, then if we draw a third curve that shows the, molecular, the distribution of molecular speeds for CO2 at 100 degrees C, how would this change? Would the peak be higher? The peak wouldn't be higher because you still have fraction of molecules, but it would be more skewed to the faster speed because the molecules will be moving faster at higher temperature. Right? So it would look like this. Something like that. Oh my god, that makes sense because the CO2 is not changing. Because CO2 is CO2 is number two, so it's gonna be faster and more spread out, so therefore the peak's gonna be lower than number two. Alright. The temperature is higher, but think about what the what higher means. Higher tells you fraction of molecules. So actually, as the temperature goes down, it'll get higher because there'll be less of a spread of velocities. There'll be more of just, they'll have more similar velocities. Right. All right. So uh, in the figure to the right, which ground state atoms have a single S electron in the outermost shell? And if you can't see it on the thing, this is one, two, three, four, and five. So um, a single S electron in the outermost shell. One. One. What else? Two. Two. And three. One, two, and three. Right? So one is uh, sodium, right? So that's a three S one in its outermost shell. What? CU is copper, AU is gold. So gold is three under copper, so you expect it has that same effect. With, with two and three, those are the ones that are almost half filled. So the one electron will jump back from the S, and there will only be one S electron. Yeah, and ones that behave such. There are other ones in the middle there that for various other reasons don't count. Two is uh, chromium. Well, it's it's not about it's not about remembering. It's about understanding why that happens. Right? Anytime you have a half-filled D shell, or you, anytime you can make a half-filled D shell by taking one electron from the S, that will happen. That's what you're doing. And so that happens, or or a filled D shell. So that happens in this row, and also in this row. Right? For all this. Um, because of those, yeah, because of those reasons. All right. So which ones have filled sets of S and P orbitals? Five. Just five. Yeah. Uh, what about a filled set of D orbitals? Three. Just three. Half filled set? Two. Just two. Two electrons in the outermost, or two S electrons in the outermost shell. Four and five. Four and five. Four and five. We'll both have two S electrons and then some P electrons also. Two and three won't because of that one electron that jumps back to the D. And then which of these have no electrons in D orbitals? One, one four, and Yeah, because it's just one point per part, so. Sorry. Um, all right. I didn't understand that the one that is four Yeah, I don't understand them either. I thought we have to just remember the exceptions, and you didn't really talk about why is that four? No, no, no. We said any time that there, anytime you can gain one electron to get to a half-filled shell or a full-filled shell, 
then the S electron, one of the S electrons will come back and do that. So it can be a lot of them. Uh, it can be like... Uh, yeah, it's it's not not like There's essentially six of them that fit that. There are six of them that fit that rule. Um, and then also that rule applies to some of the F electrons. But there are other ones within the transition metals that don't fit that rule but still have that jump back. And those you don't have to know because they... There isn't an, a nice um, theory behind that. It's just, I mean, there are, but it's a more complex, it's more com complex collection of reasons. So, um, essentially, well, I guess we could talk about it. As we know from the hydrogen atom, as you get higher in, en higher in energy level, like N level, the levels get closer and closer together. So it becomes less of an energy cost to have that electron jump back to a previous um, orbital. All right. So what do you think is bigger? Um, neon or a xenon? What do you think is a bigger atom? Size-wise? Size-wise. Neon is bigger than xenon? Why? Did you say because there's fewer electrons that I don't remember you explaining that. Well, let's, let's first define this, because size is kind of a bad word. Because there's two things that can be size, right? Size can be mass, and size can be volume, like amount of space it takes up. So a better way to talk about this is atomic radius. Because if we talk about size and mass, we can just look at the numbers. What about atomic radius? Xenon and neon. What do you think takes up more space, has a bigger radius, if we assume it's a sphere? Why do you think it's the same? We'll start with you, and then you can. I mean, the way I remember it's the same group, so that's. Same group, so they're all the same radius? Okay, why do you think? You thought xenon's bigger, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so you're right, and you're less so this time. But that's okay, you'll get the next one. Um, yeah, as you have more electrons, remember we talk about the outermost shells, and remember we saw those pictures of the shapes of the orbitals, and as n gets bigger, the orbitals get further and further out from the nucleus, which means that the places where it's more likely to find an electron becomes further and further away from the nucleus. So generally, atomic radius increases with n, quantum number n. So pretty much anything in the first row is going to be smaller than anything in the second row, be smaller than anything in the third row, um, and so on. That's, here, there's a picture in your book that's, that's not good. Um, but then there's one that's OK. So let me see if I can find that. All right, here's atomic radii. So first, don't worry about all the little stuff in between. We're going to talk about that. But let's just look at the tops of, or the bottoms of those peaks, these red dots. Those are the noble gases. So as you go from helium to xenon, increase atomic number, you increase the atomic radius. Essentially, it goes like this. It's bigger and bigger. Okay. Um, same thing happens in every row, and you can see that. It doesn't get bigger linearly. It doesn't get bigger by the exact same amount each time, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger reliably. And that's a reliable trend that you can use and you can think about, um, and you can know that anything below is going to be bigger 
radius-wise than anything above. OK, so that's the first trend. Usually when we talk about, these things are called periodic trends. So we talk about as you go across or down the periodic table, what happens. So this is the up and down trend. Based on this graph, and this one's a little less intuitive, I think, and what happens if you go left to right? Based on the graph, going left to right, do the, does the radius get smaller or get bigger? Look at the, look at the graph. As you go from left to right, does the radius go up or down? So as you go from, let's say, lithium to neon across the periodic table, what happens to the radius? It gets smaller. So I was everybody saying bigger. Okay, so let's say within, so these, this big trend is going down, right? Yeah. Now within the period, or going up, going down the periodic table, going up in radius. Within a period, you see it goes down, right? right here. So that's a little bit maybe counterintuitive. You're adding electrons, but the radius is going down. So how come when you add electrons in, in a group, the radius goes up, but when you add electrons in a period, it goes down? What's the difference there orbital-wise? Right, that when you're going up or down a group in the columns of the periodic table, you're changing that number n, that n number, that principal quantum number, the shell that you're at. And that's affecting that size. When you're adding electrons going across a period, you're adding electrons inside the same shell to different orbitals. Okay. And that has the opposite effect on the radius. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, any ideas why the radius should actually get smaller as you add electrons within the same orbital, within the same shell? Why does that make sense? Maybe it doesn't take a bit. Come up with whatever reason you want. It shrinks. What? It shrinks. It shrinks. That's true. That's, that's what we see. But why? Because we add up electrons. That's also true. Gets, but why? It's heavy. It gets heavy and it shrinks. It's heavy and it because shrinks. Because it pushes. Huh? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think you got the right idea. Keep thinking about that. How many photons there are? Would be more attractive. Let's say there's more photons. Let's say there's more photons. That's right. Yeah. So you got it. Okay. There's more attraction between the the electrons in the nucleus. The nucleus is positively charged, right? The electrons are negatively charged. So if you put in more positive charge and more negative charge in essentially the same space, they're going to pull each other together a little bit more. And that's what happens as you go across the period. You add protons and add electrons in, a, in approximately the same amount of space, and so they pull each other in closer, and you end up with a smaller size. All right. So let's put that as our second general rule. Atomic radius generally decreases across a period. And we're going to put a little star on this one. The first one is a pretty hard and fast rule. As you increase n, you increase atomic size. This one, if we look closely at that graph, you'll find it's not exactly true. So take a look between lithium and neon. It goes down, 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 oh, and then it actually bumps up a little bit. Down, 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 down. That one actually fits. This one goes down, but then somewhere in the middle of the transition metals starts to come up again, and then goes back down again. All right. So it's a general trend, Oops. but it's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. So let me ask you, we're not going to go through the transition metals because 
that's, a, that's another class. Um, those have various other reasons. But let's just look at that second row between lithium and neon. Where is this little weird bump, and, and why do you think that's there? Yeah. So count those dots out. Where is that little dot? So you start at lithium, and then you go to beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen. You're in the wrong row, uh, second row. Carbon. Yeah. It's nitrogen, isn't it? Here, hang on. Let me copy this so I can annotate it, and, and we can go through it here. So let, let me label this for you. So lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. What happens between nitrogen and oxygen that might cause something weird? What? Um, well, these are just the, the atomic radius, so the molecular behavior doesn't quite affect this. The pole, yeah, it has to do with the pole. No idea? <laughs> well, yeah. So what happens right there? Right ha what happens right there is that's when the P's are half filled. All right, that's when the P's are half filled. And we're actually going to come back to why that is um, because it's not, a, it's not a hugely important rule with atomic radius. As you, only, so you see, it's only an issue in the second row. But when we come back and talk about ionization energy and electron affinity, that will be a big deal. So just keep that in mind in your head right now, that that halfway point, that half-filled thing that we talked about before with the electron configurations, that's important. All right, there's a, there's a stability involved there um, that we will return to. So I want to give you a term here. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to keep it on the same file. Right. Effective nuclear charge. This is this is kind of what we're talking about when we talk about these these effects. How much does how much of a charge of the of a nuclear charge do the outermost electrons feel? Right. It's got an equation. The equation's pretty simple. That's the effective nuclear charge. This is going to be the actual nuclear charge minus the charge uh, screened by other electrons. Right. So this is how it works. Uh, it's, it makes more sense in a picture. Here's our nucleus. Let's say we're looking at lithium. So you've got a 3 plus nucleus. And then you've got three electrons. So lithium is 1s2, 2s1, right? All right. So you've got two electrons in the in the I'm going to draw them as though they're like a Bohr model. So let's say you've got an electron here and an electron here. Those are the 1s electrons. And then the outer one is going to be the 2s electron. Does that, that diagram kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. What we say is that these 1s electrons make a shield. We talked a little bit about shielding. But we say they, they effectively make a shield so that this electron isn't quite feeling that nuclear charge quite as strongly. So the effective nuclear charge for this electron is the total nuclear charge, which is 3, because it's 3 protons, minus the number of electrons that are shielding it, which is 2. 
So plus one. That's, I mean, it's a pretty simple calculation. It's just the, num the total charge in the nucleus minus the total number of core electrons. Now it gets a little bit um, it gets a little bit trickier as we go up in number because the outermost electrons can also shield each other, but that effect is not really significant. So let's look at um, beryllium then next. Configuration for beryllium is 1s2, 2s2, right? We're going to put in a similar figure, but now the nucleus is 4 plus. We still have the two electrons from the 1s. And now we have two electrons in the 2s, right? So these inner electrons still shield, but the outer ones don't really shield from each other. So the effective nuclear charge felt by any one of these outer electrons is going to be 4 minus 2 or plus 2. So what this means is beryllium is feeling a stronger effective nuclear charge or a larger effective nuclear charge than lithium. And that's why it's being pulled in more and having a smaller uh, radius. The greater, nuclear, the greater effective nuclear charge can have a greater pull on those outer electrons leading to um, the smaller radius. And this is going to be important for a lot of other things too. When we talk of, here's an example. So I might ask you on an exam or a quiz or something, why is oxygen smaller than carbon? All right? Here's a wrong answer that I'll probably get from somebody. Oxygen is smaller than carbon because it's to the right on the periodic table and atomic size decreases from left to right. Why is that a wrong answer? I didn't say anything wrong. All of those things I said are true. But why do you not get points for saying that? Yes, because it's not correct. <laughs> You're not explaining anything. You're just stating the fact in a different way. The fact that atomic size decreases, atomic radius decreases from left to right, that's an observation. That's an empirical observation. I told you that in the question, that oxygen is smaller than carbon. So when I'm asking you why, I'm asking for the chemical reason behind why that's happening. And the chemical reason behind that is that oxygen has a greater effective nuclear charge than carbon. And therefore, the electrons in the nucleus attract each other more, pulling them in and making the radius smaller. Uh, and this, we'll keep coming back to this kind of example because a lot, there's a lot of this in chapter 8 and, chapter, uh, and as we go forward. When I ask you the reason behind something, you can't say because of the trend on the periodic table. That's not a reason. That's an observation. The reason is the theory behind it that talks about why that's actually happening. And in a lot of cases, it'll come right back to effective nuclear charge. So How would you can, say can you repeat it one more time? So, so like, yeah. lithium and beryllium. Right. So let's, let's compare lithium and beryllium. Go ahead. Right. Because uh, it has greater nuclear charge than, uh, than lithium. Yeah, the outer electrons feel a greater effective nuclear charge and they pull them in. So, and I'm not saying you have to explain it like in my exact words. Right. But just so when we need for that one. Because the electron, electron charge. The charge. Right. Yeah, the effective nuclear charge. The charges, negative and positive, attract. And these are these. This pull is going to be stronger than the other. So if we do it like explain it like that in the math way, would you take it? If we but, just but you still have to say words, too, right? You have to explain it. So, so let's try another one. Let's try another one. Um. Well, we don't have to write it out. Why is why is potassium bigger than sodium? Why is a potassium atom bigger than a sodium atom? So we can do this. Not 
Not exactly. Not exactly. Right. So this is a little bit different argument for going down a column. Let's look at sodium versus potassium. You could try to calculate the effective nuclear charge. Yes, the, the, the higher end shells are further away from the nucleus. That's why it's bigger. So that's the correct answer. Um, but let's talk about why this, this argument doesn't work for that comparison. Um, sodium's, and let's write this all out. Sodium's uh, electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And potassium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. Okay. And so these are the core electrons. Oops. These are the core electrons of sodium, and these are the core electrons of potassium. So for sodium, the effective nuclear charge is 11, which is the charge of the number of protons, minus the number of core electrons, which is 10. Yeah, they're not in the outer shell. Anything not in the outter shell is core. You always leave off whatever's in the outer shell. Because it has the biggest n number. Yeah, if it were 3s2, those would both be in the outer shell. You'd leave those out. If it were 3s2, 3p4, those s's and p's would all be in the outer shell because they all have the 3. It's sort of like the opposite of the number of valence electrons. Um, yeah. not in a, not in an atom that's not an ion because you can you'll never have you can never have more uh, you can never have more core electrons than um, protons and nucleus okay, so we, we but you can have more valence electrons if you have an ion Okay, so in these cases, the effective nuclear charge is one in both cases. Right? So you can't say that one has a, has a bigger effective nuclear charge and that's why it's bigger. In this case, the reason is not a nuclear charge, but the reason is, is simply the uh, larger let's rewrite this. Uh, the n equals 4 shell is further away from the nucleus than the n equals 3 shell. Right. So that's why potassium is bigger. n equals 4 is further away, you know, further out, bigger, whatever, than the n equals 3 shell. The effective nuclear charge comes in when you're talking about within one row. All right. So let's talk about how this fits then. Don't forget about this stuff. So let's talk about how this fits with ions, and then we'll be essentially done with um, stuff for the exam. So these questions be more like, uh, how long is it, like, multiple choice? Like well, you'll see them in multiple choice, and I think there's some in the, some of the practice, practice exam, exam where there's like different explanations, and you just have to pick the correct explanation. Um, all right, so ions. Do we know what ions are? What are ions? 
They're charged particles. You can have positively charged, negatively charged. Positively charged things are called cations. Negative charged ones are anions, right? Okay. Let's look at how ions deal with, or how we deal with electron configurations of ions. So what is the electron configuration of sodium plus? How do we find that? 2P6 only because you're Yeah, so first, if you want to do this all the way out, first, there's nothing wrong with this un until you get a good sense of it. You can write the whole electron configuration for the atom and then decide what happens when you go from atom to ion. So if you're going from neutral to plus one, does that mean you're adding an electron or subtracting an electron? Subtracting, subtracting an electron. So we leave off that last electron. And now we have an ion. Great. What about S2 minus? What are you going to do? You're going to find the configuration of sulfur, right? And then you're going to do what? Add two electrons. So if sulfur is neon. 3s2, 3p4, we're going to add 2 and it becomes 3p6, which also, by the way, is just the configuration for argon. How did you get 3s2 minus? Because we're in the third row. So, what do you right, so we start with neon, 3s2. 1, 2, and then 3p, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we add two more, 5, 6. Wait, you, like skip you skip, yeah, the, the full electron configuration has them all together. Um, so we have 3p, 4, but we add yes. But you add 2 because of the 2 minus. Yep. All right. We'll, we'll talk about some of the um, strange things that happen here in a moment, but one thing that you'll note is all the ions that you already know, like you know that sulfide is a 2 minus ion. You know that oxide is 2 minus. You know that chloride is 1 minus. You know that potassium is a plus 1. I mean, we've talked about all these common ions before. Now we can actually figure them out by looking at their electron configurations you'll start to realize that all the common ions that you use, or many of them that you've used or that you've seen, actually have noble gas configuration, which means that they have a full, a full shell. And that's not an accident. There's a stability to that we know. There's a stability to having a full shell. So to form ions uh, is a way for an atom to get to that full shell. From that, then, we can, um, we can make some predictions about which ions are most likely. Sorry, I'm trying to find a picture here. I'm trying to find it. Okay. So we know, for instance, that the halogens form what ion commonly? The halogens form What, which ion do we usually commonly see in, in, of the 7A elements there? What charge? Minus 1, right? They're commonly minus 1. So you, and you can look at the periodic table and say, OK, well, when they gain an electron, they get noble gas configuration. So we can make that prediction for many others. Uh, what do you think is a common ion of um, nitrogen? Yeah, so it's actually 3 minus, nitride. That's not a super common ion, but it doesn't make a 2 minus. It doesn't make a 1 minus. It's a 3 minus. So that's because that 3 minus ion will have noble gas configuration. Yes, so things are, are trying to fill their shells. And that's kind of a driving force for, um, 
for this. Yeah, carbon's a little bit trickier. Carbon could be minus four or plus four, actually, and we see, and actually everything in between for other reasons. But the actual ion of carbon, those are, that's oxidation states, that's a little bit different, but the ion of carbon, the carbide ion is actually a minus four. Um, okay, so now here's where it gets a little bit different. What's the electron configuration for titanium 2 plus? See if you can come up with it. While you're looking at that, here's that table I was looking for looking for. You can see some of these ions that we know form common uh, predictable charges, predictable ions. And they're predictable because in all of these cases you end up with noble gas configuration. So all right, let's do this let's do this uh, out all the way. Titanium the atom has what configuration? It's argon, 4s2, 3d2, right? Okay. Well, we're going to be 2 plus now, which means we remove two electrons, right? So where do we remove those electrons from, the d or from the s? From the s. We actually remove them from the s, all right? That's right. So when you form an ion, when you build up the electron configuration, you go in order of energy. But when you ionize, when you remove the, the electrons, you remove from the outermost shell. The outermost shell here is the n equals 4 shell. So titanium 2 plus should have the configuration of AR3D2. If you had to guess, what would you think is another common oxidation state of titanium? Well, it doesn't form anions, but another cation. What, what would you guess? So you, titanium 2 plus is a common um, common ion of titanium. There's one more common ion of titanium. What do you think it might be? What? Uh, not one plus. Think about what we just talked about, about the what do ions want to get? What do atoms want to get? Four plus, right, yeah. Because if it loses those other two d electrons, it goes to noble gas configuration. So titanium four plus is also a common ion. Right, which would have the configuration of argon. Okay. So now that we've talked about ions, we can talk about ionic radius also. And we're going to save um, ionization energy and electron affinity until after the exam. But let's talk briefly about ionic radius. Uh, I guess before we do that, let me introduce one more term. Sorry. When we have something like this, where you have two atoms that essentially have the same, that, that not essentially, that have the same electron configuration, there's a word for that. And that word is isoelectronic. Having the same electron. So what we might say is that chloride, Cl minus, sulfide, S2 minus, and argon are all isoelectronic. They all have the same electron configuration. They all have the electrons in the same places uh, with the same energies. And so we will talk uh, a little bit. We'll, we'll bring that word up again when we talk about ionic radius just now. 
But what do you think? Before I just tell you, do you think, based on what we've already been talking about, that a positive ion, that is a cation, should be larger or smaller than its neutral atom? Is a cation larger or smaller than its neutral atom? And why? Why larger? Well, what's, what's repelling? No, no, no. I mean, which things are specifically repelling each other? So you're saying the nucleus starts re repelling the electron? What else? Which one would be bigger? The neutral atom? Let, let's, let's draw these. So you've got lithium. And lithium plus. The, the neutral atom will be bigger? Why? Let's look at our pictures again from before. The plus one will be smaller? Yeah. Yeah. How? You're on the right track, I think. OK, remember our picture of lithium. Two inner electrons that then shield the outer electron. And we talked about the effect of nuclear charge, right? And now lithium plus, we've lost that outer electron. So we have these two inner electrons. That's right. That's right. So in this case, there are actually two big changes. One is that you've lost the n equals 2 shell, and your outer electrons are now the n equals 1 electrons. All right? So it's almost like going a different group. But also, you've increased the effective nuclear charge considerably. Remember, the effective nuclear charge here would be 3 minus 2 core electrons. Now it's 3 minus 0, because these electrons are now the outermost electrons. So it's, a, it's not only smaller because you've lost that outer electron, but it's pulling itself in much smaller also. So this one will be much smaller. And this is a rule that you can say generally will, will always apply, that um, cations are smaller than their neutral counterparts. No, that is not an answer, because that's not a reason. That's an observation. That's a rule. That's right. If I asked you why, you'd have to say, well, because now they have a smaller, uh, a greater effective nuclear charge that pulls it in much closer, or they've lost their outer shell, and so now they're, yeah. So would be opposite? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so anions tend to be larger. But you don't have what? Than their neutral counterparts. You don't have to memorize this. If you understand. The reasons behind this, if you understand the effect of nuclear charge and the idea that, more, that higher end shells are further away from the nucleus, you can figure this out on your own just by thinking about what the effects of those rules would be. So now let's look at some isoelectronic ions. This is a common exam type question.
Put an order of increasing radius. Argons. Now, what do, what do you first realize, or what is special about these five things that I picked? They all go to argon. They're, yeah, they're all isoelectronic. They all have the same electron configuration, which is the configuration of argon. That's important, because if the electron configuration is different, then it becomes a little bit trickier question. We'll talk about those um, in the second half upstairs. But knowing that these are all isoelectronic, how are you going to decide which one's bigger and which one's smaller? Was an argon like the main one, so it would be first. Well, what do you think? Yeah. Which do the electron? Which one we did before? Not oh, with the bigger one, it can be. Right, that's what I'm saying. It would be based on the proton electron. Wouldn't you try to? Right. Yeah, I think you're all kind of on the right track here. You're looking at the chart, what we just talked about. Anions? have a much smaller effective nuclear charge, so they end up kind of ballooning out even when they have the same numbers of electrons. Cations get pulled in even when they have the same number of electrons. So if these are all isoelectronic, which they are, meaning they all have the same number of electrons, same electron configuration, then we can just rank them based on charge. So the smallest one will be the Ti4 plus because that's a big imbalance between protons and electrons and it kind of gets sucked in. And then we've got the calcium, then the argon, uh, then the sulfur, sulfide, and then the phosphide. Um, so let's see if I can actually find these. these radii for you. So argon is in picometers is 98. Let's see if we're right. And then we'll be done. Is 98. So then uh, let's look at the cations. Uh, I don't have the titanium, but I'm sure it's tiny. So I'm going to look that up. Look up the ionic radius of titanium 4 plus, and I'll get these other ones. Calcium is, this is 99. Uh, sulfur 2 minus. And I don't have the phosphorus either, but I'm sure that's big. So we were actually wrong. Calcium is a little bit bigger than argon. Um, but that's, that couldn't have been predicted from the trends. <laughs> so what's the radius of the titanium? Anybody get that? All right, we'll talk about it later. Well, let's go upstairs. So this is where we'll stop for the exam. The exam, then we'll cover the stuff about radius and electron configurations and ions. Part of chapter 8, but not ionization energy and electron affinity, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. You say the stuff we just did with electron affinity will be on the next exam?